house of the Lord today. I want to welcome our online community too. Let's sing this old hymn, Glory to His Name, this morning as we start. today. Oh, we have a Savior that loves us so much. We have so many reasons today, as Pastor Mark even said, some that we hadn't seen in months back in service today. And we just bless you in the name of the Lord. But even knowing that, we know that we have so many blessings that He bestows upon us. And God, we just glorify you today. We just ask that you lead us in this time of worship as we bless you in your name. Amen. Bless the Sing 
thankful for God's grace. Not only saves us, but it sustains us. It keeps us. And today we just want to take a, a moment and go in prayer for some special needs of our church family. Um, I try to keep you up with, with an email list, but here's some specific ones from this week. The, the Ray Champion family. Um, Mr. Ray passed away, so please keep that family in your prayer. Uh, the Bonnie Massingill family, her passing this week. Uh, Ms. Paula Coates, Mr. Billy Rhodes, Sherry Goodwin, Ms. Donna Godwin, Sethel Parker, Mr. Henry Lee, uh, Ms. Bonnie Stanley. Also, uh, the Roy and Dorothy McLam. Let's continue to lift them up. Some that came in this weekend specifically, Brother Russell Spencer, many of you know him. His family's facing a very significant crisis right now. And they're going to need our prayer, not just today, but in several days ahead. I can't disclose everything, but trust me, they, they need our prayer. So please lift them up in prayer. Mr. Felt Groves, uh, this is Debbie West's dad. He fell yesterday, was admitted to the hospital. He needs our prayer. Miss Linda Lee, which is Shelly Williams' aunt, in the hospital with blood clots in her lungs. He needs our prayer. There's uh, so many others. I'm sure you, perhaps you have an unspoken request if you just want to raise your hand. God bless you all. Our Facebook family, we're praying for you as well. Let's look to the Lord at this time for these specific needs. Gracious God and Father, we are thankful for your grace and your mercy. So thankful, dear God, that on the cross, when you were wounded for our transgressions, when you were bruised for our iniquities, when you were chastised for our peace, you provided healing for us. And it's not just a spiritual healing, dear God. We know that we can be healed physically. We can be healed emotionally and even spiritually, Lord. So we lift up the needs of our church family to you today. Hands that have gone up across this place, names that they're representing here, we pray for them. Dear God, the specific names that we've, we've spoken out, we lift them up to you today. And we know that you're able to do all things, and we pray for the healing touch that they need. And we're going to trust, dear God, that you would do it your way, and you'll do it in your timing, and you'll receive the glory for it. And we'll praise you for that, dear God. Touch and move, dear God, as we've mentioned specifically for Brother Russell Spencer's family. You see the crosses they're facing today. But I know that you're a God that will give the direction and the peace and the strength that's needed. We pray for them. Lord God, those who have called or, or texted and can't be with us today, we lift them up to you today as well. Those who are traveling, keep them safe. And Lord God, now we can submit this service back to you. We pray that you'll have your way. Dear God, it's here to bring you glory. It's our prayer today that if someone with us here love or someone listening and they're unsaved, that today would be the day and they would give their love to you. And Father, we'll give you praise for that. We'll give you honor and we'll give you glory. For it's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray and we ask these things and we all say, amen. Amen. Before you sit, maybe just, just as affirmation, can we just sing that chorus again? But God's amazing grace. And just realize our chains are gone because of him. They've been broken because of Jesus Christ. Could you just, just take a moment, just meditate on that. And from your heart, just lift it up to him once again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Uh, we praise you, Father. We magnify your name. So thankful for your grace. So thankful for your mercy. Hallelujah to God. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, sing it out to it. Have been set free. Oh, we love you, Lord. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love. clap of praise for that grace this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated if you can do so. It is great again to be in the house of God. Thank you for all, all of you being with us today. We, uh, we give the Lord the highest praise and thankful 
for so many of you that we haven't seen in several weeks and months for being with us today. It's great to see you. We're so encouraged to see you in, in God's house today. Um, many of you know, and if, if you don't, I, I, I can share it with you briefly. The years that I, I was a school teacher, I was also a football coach. And, and I was so blessed to be a part of a, um, a wonderful staff. I was not the head football coach, not on the varsity level. But I was a part of a great staff, and we were just blessed to be able to play for eight state championships. And, and some of you, that may not mean quite as much, but if you follow the high school sports, that's a really significant feat. And, and we were blessed to win four of those state championships. And, and so I've got some things, uh, that I, souvenirs from those games that we won. I've got, a, I've got some rings, I've got some footballs and some hats and things like that. But what I've done with those things, I've given them to my wife and I've given them to my daughters. They, they mean a lot to me. They talk about my personal life experiences. And, but I, I've given them, I've passed them on to my wife and my daughters. And my oldest two daughters, they've already given those things to their, their sons, my grandsons. We typically call that inheritance. When we pass something down to someone else, something that means a lot to us, whether it's a material thing or maybe money or land or whatever the case may be, we pass it to someone else, and that's called inheritance. But, but I, I've learned something. Do you know you could actually, uh, the land that your parents may give you, you can sell that land if you like to. And the um, material things that you may leave your family, it could be consumed, it could be destroyed. But I've learned something else. There are certain things that we can leave our family and we can leave our friends and they'll never be destroyed, I don't think. They'll, they'll never lose their value and they can't be sold. And it's really, it's who we are. It's the character, it's the person we are on the inside. And someone has called that legacy. Because I've learned this, if there was not a football or a ring or a, a hat or a sweatshirt, to leave to my daughters or to leave to my wife, I hope this is what they would say one day. I hope they would say, my daddy was a Christian because that can't be taken away. I hope they would say, my papa was a preacher or a pastor. That can't be taken away. I hope my wife would say, Mark was someone who wanted to see people grow in their faith in Jesus Christ. That, that's legacy. And you see, legacy, according to John Max, was what lives on after us. And, and because of that, if we're concerned about the future next generation, we've got to be very deliberate and very intentional about the legacy we want to live. Now, I've said that to say this. I think the early church that we've been studying and reading about, I think they made a commitment to legacy. And we're going to talk about that today in the book of Acts chapter 4. But while you're finding that, just as a, as a review from this we, we've learned about the early church, how it was birthed, how it was started. And, and we've also seen how the early church felt opposition from the enemy. But yet I've shared with you the early church made several commitments that allowed them to overcome the enemy and they continue to grow. For example, we remember when there was a concern about the disruption between the widows. The early church made a commitment to prayer, and they made a commitment to the Word of God. And the church did not divide. It wasn't destroyed. It continued to get better. And, and then when there was a, a concern about the dispersion or the scattering of the people of God, they made a commitment to their vision, which was to share the gospel. It was evangelism at its best. And they shared the Word of God wherever they went. When there was a concern about deception coming into the church, the early church made a commitment to holiness, to stand for what was right and be committed to Jesus Christ. And the church continued to grow and it continued to get better. When there was a concern about developing new believers, they made a commitment to discipleship, to help people grow in their faith. When there was a concern about direction and which way do we need to go, there was a commitment to the Holy Spirit leaning and depending on Him. I want to close this series by talking to you today about legacy because when there was a concern about the destiny and the future of the church, 
They made a commitment to legacy, a commitment to making sure the church would continue on. And we see that in Acts chapter 4, verse 20. The Bible says this, For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. For we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We may be familiar with this passage of Scripture. God had used Peter and John to heal a lame man who had been lame from his mother's womb. And the people saw this man leaping and praising God. And what they did, they surrounded themselves around Peter and John. And, and Peter said, it's not through us. It's by the name of Jesus Christ that this man has been healed. And he began to preach and he said, you need to repent of your sins. And the Bible says at least 5,000 then, you know, the church grew to that number. And the church continued to grow and it continued to get better. Now, the religious leaders didn't like it. So they threatened these guys. They said, don't preach and don't teach anymore in the name of Jesus now, the enemy may have thought right here, I've got them now. Because if I can stop them from preaching and teaching Jesus, people will not repent and people will not be converted. And if people are not being uh, repentant, if they're not converting, the church will stop growing. But these guys made up their mind, we can't do that. The, the future of the church is too important. So we've got to make a commitment to the legacy of the church. Now, what am I saying to you today is this. I don't know, but we really need to think about not just the church today. We need to think about the future of the church. We need to think about what do we want to see for our children? What is the church that we want to see for our grandchildren? And with all due respect, they, their church needs to be more than a beautiful campus or a debt-free building, or a large bank account. If that's all we're working for, I'm afraid to tell you, buildings can be sold, buildings can be destroyed, bank accounts can be depleted, but we need to leave them something greater than what we're seeing right now. We need to be concerned about the future and the legacy of the church. We need to be concerned about my grandchildren and your grandchildren and these little kids who are coming up behind us. We need to make sure that there's a commitment that we want the work of God to go on. We want the witness for God to continue on. We want the worship of God to continue on. We want to commit to a legacy of the church that will not go down with our generation, but it will continue to go forward. So how do we do it? There's a couple of things in this verse I want to pick on today that I, I hope will help us out. When it comes to leaving a, a legacy, when, it be, when we're committed to that, the first thing I see in this verse we need to get is this. It's the decision to leave a legacy. This is very important. If we want to commit to a legacy, there needs, a, there needs to be a decision to leave a legacy. And what I'm saying about that is this. How would you really want to be remembered? If someone would summarize your life in one sentence, what would you want them to say? What would you want someone to say at your funeral? That, that's what I'm getting at. For Peter and John, their commitment was this. We are going to share what we've seen and what we've heard. This is so important. We're going to make it a commitment and we're making a decision. We're going to share what we've seen and what we've heard. You got to keep in mind, they were commanded. They were threatened. Don't preach don't teach in the name of Jesus. And for these guys, they would say it this way. For me not to preach and teach Jesus, that's going to violate what I believe in. That, that's going to go against what, I, what I'm hoping and what I'm believing in, what I'm trusting in. And I can't do that because it's going to compromise the legacy I want to live. So let me say it this way. With all due respect, I've got to make a decision to share what I've seen and what I believe in. I'm not going to create a riot, but I've made a decision. 
I'm going to share what I've seen and what I've heard. I'm not going to debate and argue with people, but I've made a decision. I've got to speak what I've seen and what I've heard. Listen to me today. I am not going to hurt anyone. I'm going to speak the truth in love, but I will speak the truth about what I've seen in Jesus and what I've heard in Jesus. I've got to commit to the legacy. The church is not going to stop with me. The church is going to continue on because I know what I want to leave. Now, for, for Peter, can you just imagine what he would say? Peter would say something like this. I've experienced something that other people need to see. I've witnessed some things that other people need to hear about. I, yes, I've seen Jesus, and I've heard Jesus speak. I remember when he walked up one day, and he said, follow me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. And for the last three years or so, I've been with him, and I've seen things about this man, and I've heard things about this man that I just can't get away from. And as long as I live, I've got to share what I've seen. I've got to share what I've heard. I remember seeing him one day sit down by a mountainside, and I heard him speak the principles of his kingdom. I heard him talk about how we love God and how we love people, how we have to live in his kingdom. And I've got to share that with others. I've watched this man be around those with leprosy. I've watched him be around the blind and the death, even the dead. And I saw him work miracles and I saw him deliver people. I can't keep that solid. I've got to share what I've seen. I've got to share what I've heard. I've watched this man. Listen, I was in a storm one night and I saw him walk on the water and I knew it was him and he spoke to me he said come and I got a boat and I walked on the water and when I began to sink he I just called out and he saved me I can't keep that stuff in I got to tell what I know I got to share what I've seen I watched this man I watched him when he was arrested I watched him when he was beaten but do you know I even denied him I watched this man when he was crucified I saw him buried but I started back fishing but I saw him alive after then I saw the resurrected Lord and he came to me and he asked me do you love me I said yes he said well feed my sheep and I watched him ascend back to heaven but before he left he said you will be a, a witness for me just stay in Jerusalem a little bit longer and wait for the outpour the promise of God he filled me with his spirit and I can't help but share what he's done for me I've got to share what I've seen I got to share what I've heard the legacy will continue on because I've made that kind of commitment here's the question we need to ask ourselves this morning, what do we want to leave for our children? Let's make it real practical. What do we want to leave for them? What kind of church do we want to see them have in 5, 10, 20 years at the Lord should tarry? I'll be the first to say, you know, some of their practices and some of their methods, they're going to change in the next several years. It's, it's the way the world goes. Listen to me, I'm not too concerned about their practices and their methods. What I'm concerned about is their message. I want to make sure that, that we make a decision today that we're going to leave a legacy that some things will never change. And it's going to continue on and it'll continue on. I want to make a, a decision today that they will make a commitment, that they will be a church that's committed to the preaching, the teaching, the practicing, and the living of the Word of God. It's not compromise. It's still settled in heaven, and my children can preach it, and my grandchildren can preach it, and so can yours. I want to leave a legacy that one day they'll continue to believe the gospel message. I'm talking about from the eternal sonship of Jesus Christ to his virgin birth, to his sinless life, to his sacrificial death, to his glorious resurrection. They still preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to leave a legacy where they still love God and they still love people. I want to leave a legacy so they're not ashamed to worship and to praise God. I want to leave a legacy so that one day they're looking for the Lord to return one day. He doesn't have to stop with me. He can go on to the next generation and the next generation if we'll make a decision. We are going to leave a legacy for our children. I don't know how you feel about it, but when I see the world today, all the disruptions, all the deception, all the dispersion of people. It concerns me as a pastor, but it also concerns me about children 
You see, mine are scattered, man. They're not just 26 and 24. I've got an eight-year-old here on the front row. And I don't know if I'll be around, you know, to see what it's going to be like when she gets my age. So I realize this. I have got to make a decision today that I'm going to do everything I can to leave a legacy that she knows as far as my dad's house, we leave the word of God. It's what the way I was brought up, we still prayed. The way that I brought up, we still worshiped. The way that I brought up, we didn't mind fasting. The way I was brought up, holiness was still important. The way I was brought up, there's still something called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm saying if we want it, we got to leave that kind of legacy today. If we want to commit to legacy, it starts with a decision to leave a legacy. And that's up to you. I can't make that decision for you. you got to make up your mind. It doesn't stop there. It's not just a decision to leave a legacy. This is important. You ready? But it's also the discipline to live the legacy. Get that down if you're a note taker. Not just the decision to leave it, but the discipline to live it. And what I mean by that is this. We have to live what we want others to become. I don't think you got that real good. We've got to be the model and the example that we want them to become in the future. Yeah. yeah. What we want to see in our children, that's what we got to live before them. I, I don't think you're still getting that. What I want in the future for this church is the way I've got to live right now. And I think that's what was going on with Peter and John. Notice what they said. He, he says, now listen, we... We are going to share what we've seen and what we've heard. But get the first part of this first. He's, in the King James, it says, we Amen. cannot but speak. Right. Do you get that? We cannot but speak. What's he saying? I can't stop speaking about what I've seen and heard. I can't stop sharing what I've seen and heard. I can't stop telling what I've seen and what I've heard. I can't stop I'm preaching what I've seen and heard. It's who I am. It's in my DNA. It's my spiritual being. I've got to do it. I'll be consumed if I don't. I've got to continue to do it. In other words, I'm going to live what I want to leave. I'm going to live. And I think we see that in the book of John. You know, John says something really interesting in Peter here. In the book of John, in chapter 20, I think it is, John said something like this. He said, he said, Jesus did several signs before his disciples, several things we saw before. Him. He said, this book wouldn't contain them all. Right. This next statement is very important. But what I have written, don't miss this, what I have written in this book, I've written so they will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Yeah. This is so important. John is saying this way, there's people who have never seen what I've seen about Jesus. But I'm going to write some things down so they will believe. Amen. There are some people who will never, they've never heard what I've heard Jesus say to me. But I'm going to write some things down so they will believe who he is. What does that mean? It means I'm going to live what I want to leave, and I'm going to live it through my writing. So maybe that's why John opened up his book and said something like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And maybe he says, you know what? If people can believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, if they can believe in his eternal sonship, well, the church will not stop. The church will continue to go forward. And then he wrote about meeting a woman at the well in Samaria. Remember that story? And this woman had been married, what was it, five times, I guess, and, and the man she had then was not her own. But Jesus talked with this woman. He talked to her about worship. And the scripture says she's left her water pots. And she ran into the city and said, come see a man who told me all that I've ever done. It's not this the cross. And the Bible says many of those Samaritans believe. Now here's a lesson for me and you. Maybe if we have the mindset today and we're willing to live, that it doesn't matter who comes through our doors, regardless of their past or regardless of their reputation or regardless of their position in life, we can still share Jesus with them. The church is 
not going to die in this generation. It'll continue to go forward. Jesus went on. And, and if you remember, Jesus talked about meeting Lazarus in the book of John. Yeah, he loved Lazarus, but Lazarus was sick. I mean, he, by the time he got there, Lazarus had been dead four days. And, and Jesus did this. He walked to his tomb, and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, he that was dead came forth in grave clothes. He said, loose him and let him go. What are you saying, Pastor Mark? I'm saying this. If we can believe that Jesus can raise Lazarus from the dead, I believe we can believe he can raise me, and he can raise you. And if people will believe that, the church is not going to stop, because one day Jesus is coming back, and he's going to call us home to be with him. We can believe that today. I'll tell you something else. Amen. Go ahead and give him praise. He wrote about Thomas. Remember the story in, in John 20 about Thomas? Yeah, Jesus appeared after his resurrection to all of his disciples, and, and Thomas was not there. And Thomas made this comment, unless I see the, the nail prints in his hands, I will not believe. Unless I see his side that was pierced, I will not believe. Eight days later, Jesus comes back. And this time, Thomas is in the room. Yeah. And he tells Thomas, Thomas, here's my hands. Why don't you put your, nail, why don't you put your finger right there in that nail print? Thomas, here's my side. Put, put your hand right here. And he says these words to Thomas. Now stop doubting and start believing. And Thomas said, my Lord, my God. Now this is important. Jesus said, you, listen, you've believed because you've received. But blessed are those who have not seen and they still believe. What are you saying? I'm saying John was rotting. John was writing for people like you. And John was writing for people like me. People who have never seen Jesus. People who have never seen the miracles. People who have never heard the parables. But by faith I believe the written word of God. And the spirit of God is able to convict me. And because we believe, we're able to continue on. And the church continues to grow. And it continues to get forward. I'm saying John lived his legacy through his writing. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Now, here's the question for us. What and how are we living in front of our children and our grandchildren? Listen again. How are we living in front of them? Because the way we live is what we're leaving. Amen. Now, you may say, I disagree, Pastor Mark. Well, I disagree with you as well. That's right. Amen. Yeah. I, I, listen. What my girls have seen growing up, my older girls, that's going to impact the way they live. And the way Zoe, the way she sees Linda and myself now, that's how she's going to live. So the question is, you know, what do we want for our church in the future? It depends on how we're having church right now. You with me? Yeah. Because our kids and all those little kids in the back and all of our services, if, they, if, they, if we want to have a church for them in the future, I'm not talking about some building Listen to me, yeah, we can always put up a building. We can always change the furniture. We can always do things with technology. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ. Man, if that's what we want, man, our children need to realize that in this place, we still believe that Jesus Christ is the head of the church and he has saved us from a life of sin and he's placed us in his body and he's put us in a position so that we can serve him. If we want to see that kind of church in the future, we've got to live that kind of church right now. Let me tell you something. If we want them to worship in the future, we got to worship now. Our kids need to come together and they need to see that we come together as body and believers and we still lift up our voices and we're not ashamed to lift our hands to praise and to worship God. If we want in the future, it's got to happen right now. If we want them to witness for God in the future, we've got to witness for God right now. They need to see that through our conversations and through our conduct that we live a life that would honor God. We're not shaming God. We're not embarrassing God. We're living a life that would bring Him glory. If we want to see them work for God, they need to see us working for God. That we've discovered our gifts. We've developed our gifts and we're using them for the glory of God. What we want in the future, we live it now. What you want to become tomorrow, you live it today. Amen. You live it today. Amen. I'm going to close out here. I've got to. A little boy and his mom and his dad, they were all sitting in church. And it was a cartoon script, of course. But the little boy said this, Daddy, Mama wants to be home cooking. 
You want to be playing golf. I want to go home and play football. Why are we here? Now, we can sort of get a chuckle out of that cartoon. But what if that's a real picture of the future of the church? What if? Yeah. What if one day our kids say, why are we here? Why are we here? What if they're saying that right now? Mom, you're on your telephone. The preacher thinks you're looking at the scripture, but you're actually on Facebook. I'm, just, I, I'm not saying that's happening here. It's probably happening in some church somewhere. Yeah. Daddy, you're not looking. You're dozing. Not in this church. But why are we here? I really want to go home and get on the Nintendo or the PlayStation or whatever we have today. Why are we here? Guys, that's a very serious question. Why are we here? Let's make a decision today. That's not going to be the legacy of our church. And we're going to go forward. And we're going to be committed to our worship. We're going to be committed to our work. And we're going to be committed to our witness. We're going to live in a way that honors God. And the church will continue to go forward. I want you to bow your heads all over this place. Close your eyes. Lee, I don't know, maybe we can go back to Amazing Grace. It just, if you, don't, if you don't mind. If you don't mind. I get the sense that there's a need for repentance today. Because maybe not you, but there, there's some who will come because it's just the right thing to do. They're coming because it's the routine. And they're failing to come because it's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Could you just look at yourself for just a moment and ask if, if the future of the church depended on my relationship with God, what would that future look like? If the future of just the local, the Benson PH Church, if it depended on me, if it depended on my witnessing for God, what would our witness in the future look like? If the future of the Benson PH Church depended on my work for God, what would that work look like in the future? If the future of the Benson PH Church depended on my worship, what would worship look like in the future? Would the next generation just say, why are we here? Or would they know? Now, wherever you are, allow the Spirit of God to begin to talk to you. He's saying different things right now. For some of us, it may be, we might be a little bit more committed if it wasn't for the extra work. For some, it might be, we could be a little bit more committed if it was not for the extracurricular activities. For some, it would, we might could be a little bit more committed if we would let go of the past and forgive and move on. He's going to speak in different ways. But if the future depended on you, what would it look like? If they summarized your life in one sentence, what would they say? Thank God for their faithfulness. Or would it be something else? Right where you are, just make an altar at your seat. Begin to talk to God. Maybe we need to ask for forgiveness. Maybe we need to ask for the strength to continue on. Maybe we need to ask for help on how to be a better role model, how to be a better example. What is it that we need to pray for today? Perhaps the greatest need, and I say is the greatest need, for those who said, Pastor Mark, the future will not look good because I haven't made the commitment, first of all, to serve Jesus. 
And if that's you, friend, I'll give you an invitation to come to this altar. Let me pray with you. If you're here today and you know that you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you know that you're not forgiven, but you have a desire to be, would you come at this time? Let me pray with you. Surrender your life to Jesus today. And while this church is praying, maybe you're on Facebook and you're listening to us and you want to ask Jesus into your heart, you can do it there just as well. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you love me and I know your son Jesus died for me. Today I ask you to forgive me of my sin and I'll receive Jesus as my personal Savior and I'll make a decision this day to commit my life to Him. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. If you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe a prayer of rededication, would you let us know there in the chat on Facebook so we can connect with you? Maybe some of you prayed it from your seat. Would you just see me after the service? so we can talk to you about your next step with Jesus. And for all of us, can we pray this? Just let me pray over you together. Gracious God, we we thank you that you've made a promise. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lord, you've laid a foundation that's tried and it's true, a foundation that's solid. But Lord God, you are forming the church with people people like all of us. So we pray today, dear God, that we would be the people of God that you've called us to be. That we would not be selfish if that's been our thoughts. But Lord God, from now on, we'll be thinking about our next generation. That we will realize our children, our grandchildren, nieces, nephews, they are watching us. They are watching us. Lord, not just in this church building, but Lord God, when we're at home, When we're in the marketplace, wherever we are, there are going to be followers of us. Lord God, I pray today for single parents who are bringing children along for the strength that they need. I pray today, dear God, for perhaps families where one spouse is saved and one is unsaved. Lord God, that some would make that commitment to let their children see, well, I will continue faithfully to the Lord. And I'll continue to bring my children up in the way of God. Lord, help us to leave a legacy that your work will continue on. And we'll give you praise. We'll give you honor and glory. For it's in the name of your son, Jesus. We pray and we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Praise God. God bless you all. We love you. We thank you for being with us today. I ask, if you will, to please cooperate with our ushers as they uh, help you to exit the building. May God keep you as my prayer.